안녕하세요. Oh, very good, thanks. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Eddie Yu and I'm currently the Vice President of Australia Korea Young Professionals Association and I'll be your MC for tonight. Before we make a start, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered here on the land of the first and continuing custodians of the Kulin Nation and offer our respect to the elders past and present to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Tonight's launch is not only a special time for us, but as a lot of Koreans here in the audience tonight, it's one of our special weeks in the Korean calendar. Does everyone know what that is? That's it. Okay, very good. Okay, so Chuseok, uh, otherwise known as the Korean Thanksgiving Day, um, is where Koreans congregate all the families um, together in one seating uh, in one, throughout, throughout the week. Um, over three days to celebrate with their families with plenty of food and enjoyment and that's exactly what we're trying to do here tonight. We have an exciting program of events this evening. Shortly you'll, hear, you'll be hearing from Liz Johnson, um, our president, and we also have two very special guests. Mr Bill Patterson, thank you, thank you very much for attending. Um, he is the former Australian ambassador to South Korea and also Mr Shane Elliott, obviously the CEO of, of ANZ Banking Group who will both share their views and insights with regards to the Australia and Korea relationship. There will be a Q&A session following their speeches and they both have kindly offered to stay around for the networking event as well. Towards the end of the night, we'll be giving away two How Park wines, um, thanks, uh, thanks to Richard Birch um, from How Park and Birch Family Wine, all the way from WA, so thank you Richard. Um, we'll be giving away two of their finest Pinots, um, so please do stay behind, and if you haven't put your business card in a bowl somewhere, I can't really see it. Uh, I think it was at the front, but you know, just feel free to drop a few business cards in there. Oh, actually, just one business card. Um, not a <laughs> okay, and more importantly, I just want to thank everyone here. Um, thank you very much for coming all the way down to Docklands. I know it's a bit of a windy place, um, and also give up your time um, on a Thursday evening. So thank you very much. Um, we also would like to thank ANZ, of course, um, for hosting this event in this venue and also the catering a little bit later on uh, during the networking session. So thank you again, Shane, uh, for providing this premises. We're also pleased to announce that Kotra um, is here and also the sponsor of tonight's event. And we have some information um, regarding how to invest in, uh, in Korea as well. So there's a desk um, right there. So if anyone's interested, uh, please do head over there during the uh, networking event and um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> also, um, Miranda Day, where is she? There she is, right there. <laughs> Great timing. <laughs> so she is our local Australian hanbok designer, uh, the, Korean, the traditional um, Korean dress. So thank you to, um, to you to, uh, for coming over here and um, showcasing your wonderful design. Um, so anytime during the event, feel free to talk to Miranda um, to talk about her nice piece of work. So thank you. Okay, so before I hand over to Liz, I'd uh, just like to mention a few housekeeping rules. If you could please uh, put your phone into a silent mode, that would be much appreciated. If you do have to leave, please do so in an ordinary fashion. Um, and I believe the bathrooms are somewhere there. I'm sure you guys can work that out. Um, without any further ado, let's uh, welcome Liz Johnson onto the stage. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Liz and I am the President of the Australia Korea Young Professionals Association. It is my absolute pleasure and honour to be standing here and welcoming you to the launch of the Victoria chapter of the Australia Korea Young Professionals Association, or we like to call it EKIPA. Tonight has been three years in the making, so please trust me when I say I'm very excited and pleased to be addressing you this evening. The idea for a kippa came about three years ago when a group of us realised that there were a lot of other bilateral business organisations targeted at young professionals, but there was a gap. Korea was missing. So I'm pleased that today we can celebrate that this gap has now been filled. Unfortunately, the Australia-Korea relationship is one that isn't well understood or well recognised in Australia. Yet it is a relationship that is incredibly important and strategic. 
Many of you might not know that Korea is Australia's fourth largest trading partner. Our economies are extremely complementary. POSCO, the fourth largest steelmaker in the world, is Australia's single largest customer. Korea is home to the fourth largest pension fund, the NPS, which is actively looking overseas for investment opportunities. Further, many of the household goods and appliances in your and my home, such as those from LG and Samsung, are not necessarily recognised as Korean brands. These facts are not widely known and Korea, South Korea that is, hardly attracts the attention of our media. Whether it is in traditional areas of export, such as raw materials, or emerging opportunities such as funds management, Australia needs to start positioning ourselves to take full advantage of these opportunities. With the implementation of CAFTA in December 2014, these opportunities are only increasing and with the support of government programs such as the Hamer Scholarship and the new Colombo Plan, we expect to see more young Australians take full advantage of these opportunities. We hope that EKIPA will play an active and important role in supporting young professionals to pay attention to and act on these emerging opportunities. We also hope that EKIPA will provide a pool of talent to Australian companies doing business in Korea and for Korean companies active in Australia. This pool of talent will comprise young professionals that understand the Korean culture, can speak the Korean language and know how to do business in Korea. The purpose of EKIPA is simple and we have six clearly defined goals. One, to foster the development of future business leaders in the Australia Korea Corridor. Two, to generate new interest from young professionals currently not involved in the Australia career relationship. Three, to increase awareness amongst the young professionals of the evolving and emerging business opportunities in the Australia career corridor. Four, to develop career capability, cross-cultural intelligence and practical skills of young professionals to help them effectively engage with career. Five, to provide a voice for young professionals committed to advancing the bilateral business relationship. And finally, six, to provide networking opportunities between young professionals and with the broader business community to develop and strengthen people-to-people -people connections and foster institutional links. So overall, our mission is to equip the next generation of leaders with the skills and knowledge they need to take full advantage of opportunities with South Korea. The establishment of a KIPA would not have been possible with a few key, without, without the support of a few key people in this room. We are incredibly thankful to the Victorian government for funding the establishment of a KIPA. Thank you also to ANZ, the longest standing Australian bank in Korea with a 37 year history for hosting us here this evening and being our first corporate sponsor. I would also like to acknowledge the huge effort made by the EKIPA committee. All of tonight's preparations, the website, the event invitations and the strategy has been done by the outstanding EKIPA team. I would like to quickly introduce you to each of the committee members quickly and I'm gonna ask you to stand up. Um, so we have Eddie Yu, who you've met as the vice president of EKIPA. Sean Hong, the Executive Director, Sponsorships and Partnerships. Ravi Ravanashka, the Executive Director of Marketing and Communications. Esther Cho, Executive Director of Memberships. And finally, John Park, the Executive Treasurer, Treasurer of the Kippa. I think we have exchanged about a thousand messages over Kakao Talk in the last few weeks in preparation for tonight. So thank you very much for your time in the wee hours of the morning and late at night. Can you all please join me once more in thanking this outstanding group of people. <laughs> Going forward, our plan is to organise a mix of social and formal events. These events will be targeted at increasing the profile of the Australia career relationship to profile individuals or organisations that are removing the barriers and succeeding in career 
and helping young professionals understand where the opportunities lie and how to best position ourselves to take full advantage of them. So to that effect, if anyone in this room has any ideas or suggestions, we would be pleased to hear them. In summary, thank you all for your support and we hope that you will continue with us on this journey to elevate the profile of the Australia career relationship. Come time with us. Speaker number one, Bill Patterson. Um, Mr. Bill Patterson uh, was the former Australian ambassador to Korea from 2013 to 2016. Mr. Patterson was Australia's representative of the United Nations Command for Korea and worked closely with US forces Korea, positioning Australia as a key security partner to both US and South Korea. Prior to this, Mr. Patterson served as an Australian ambassador for counterterrorism and head of International Security Division for Australia's DFAT with posts in Middle East, Southeast Asia, the US and Europe. Mr. Patterson was also, has also served as an ambassador to Thailand, as well as serving as a minister of, in Australian Embassy in Tokyo. And his other overseas posting include Dakar, Baghdad, Vienna and Washington. He is currently an executive board member for Australia Korea Business Council. And to round off his impressive resume, he has been awarded the Public Service Medal in 2003, as well as Humita Humanitarian Overseas Medal in 2005. So could you please uh, give a warm, warm welcome to Mr. Bell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction, Eddie. And let me, let me uh, first say, I'm on and um, can, can I... Uh, say that I hope for all of the Koreans here tonight that you've all had a happy and uh, chusak this week and some time off. Koreans don't take much time off, so I hope you've uh, <laughs> found the opportunity to do that this week. Uh, first, let me congratulate you on the formation of the AKYPA. Uh, this, is a, this is a great initiative, and, I, and I'm delighted to see the turn up uh, here tonight with many Australian Koreans in, in attendance and sadly not as many uh, uh, non-Korean Australians and I hope that that will change as you get into stride. But it's reflective uh, of, a, of, of a problem I think we have in the relationship and a problem that I found at the other end also uh, in Seoul. Uh, if it's EXO's current visit to Australia then it's big news. But if it's the relationship, then I think uh, uh, less so. And of course, I remind you that I was not only ambassador to uh, the Republic of Korea, I was also ambassador to North Korea and travelled there a number of times. And I'm left with the feeling uh, that Australians probably know more about North Korea than the South, due to media coverage of Little Rocket Man his threats and his rapid development of, a, of, of a nuclear and missile capabilities and, uh, and some alarmism as to his attentions. But of course it's the, it's the Republic of Korea, South Korea, that has been, is and will be of much greater significance really for Australia. But South Korea is largely unknown in Australia. As Liz pointed out, there's little appreciation of its importance to us. The Korean, Korean War is the forgotten war. Our car, our TV, our smartphone, our laptop and our air conditioner may be Korean. But we really don't care. But as Liz says, Korea is Australia's third largest export market and our fourth largest trading partner overall, including investment flows in both, uh, both directions. We have a, a free trade agreement in place and we, have, uh, we, we are also Korea's, and this is something not, people don't really focus on, Korea's second largest defence partner after the United States. Now, we're very small by comparison. The US has 28,500 troops on the peninsula and we, we see their, their forces in action every day on our television. But uh, our Prime Minister, some weeks ago, committed us to assist Korea 
if there were a, a new contingency on the Korean Peninsula. So it matters, but we're largely ignorant of it. Here in Victoria, of course, I'm reminded of the fact that the state of Victoria is twice the size of the Republic of Korea. And, and yet the Republic of Korea has 50 million people in a country half the size of Victoria, and 70% of it is mountainous. So it's now, it's I think the third most densely populated country in the world. And, and my comments tonight are obviously directed mainly uh, at the non-Korean Australians in the audience. Korea was extremely poor, uh, an extremely poor agricultural country until the 1960s. Much of the development prior to that was in fact in North Korea and it was only I think in around 1963 that South Korea's growth exceeded that of North Korea. But South Korea is now highly urbanised, highly developed. It has, and I, I feel this every day, the fastest Wi-Fi in the world. <laughs> it has a, a fantastic fast train network of, uh, and highway network throughout the country, a superb subway system, the world's best women golfers, of course, 40% of the top women golfers in the world are Korean. And Korea, as we all know, is a big, uh, big producer of a whole range of everything from automobiles, electronics. Uh, but what's less known, I think, is it's also now become one of the world's biggest producers of cosmetics. It's one of the world's biggest producers of biopharmaceuticals. And it has developed a very big research base uh, uh, in addition to, of course, to a traditional industries in steel, shipbuilding, chemicals uh, uh, and automobiles. Of course, the 1960s, the development there from a very poor country to a, to a, to a very developed one, uh, Asian, it's sort of Asian tiger status, built a great deal of pride. But now Korea is a developed country and it's back, uh, back with the pack. Growth has slipped from 7 8% a year back to 25 3% a year, compounded by a rapidly ageing uh, society. It's, um, it's, uh, it's got some big challenges, I think, uh, in terms of structural, uh, structural uh, difficulties that have to be overcome and governments, I think, that aren't, and this is not, not something that's entirely uncommon, uncom governments that are not entirely courageous in breaking through with some of the big bang uh, reforms, particularly in the financial sector, that are needed to take Korea into the next, uh, into the next phase of its development. Its core industries, steel, shipbuilding, chemicals, are, are facing some real, these are in many ways sunset industries, and whilst Korea is moving ahead, uh, developing a whole range of new industries, uh, it's got some way to go, uh, and it has to also, at the same time, build things for an ageing population like better health services, uh, old, uh, aged care facilities, and the like, in which Australia has some significant uh, skills it can share. Um, just briefly, uh, uh, Liz, I think, has covered off on the fact that uh, uh, companies like POSCO, POSCO is Australia's single biggest customer for anything and a great supporter of the relationship. We're also, and this is perhaps less well known, uh, we are a major supplier of wheat and grains and meat. When I last looked, the sale, the sale of Australian beef to Korea had topped $1.2 billion per year. It's now a major market for Australian beef. Tourists, Koreans, something like 280,000 Koreans now visit Australia every year. Uh, the flow in the other direction is quite small by comparison. Uh, it's around 50,000. But, uh, uh, but the Korean ambassador in Canberra tells me now also, and some of you, of course, because you live here, know that, that the Korean community in Australia is now very substantial indeed. It's around 180,000. Uh, so, uh, and of course, typically, it, it doesn't attract much attention. It's a community that has has uh, uh, has integrated extremely well and is extremely hardworking and extremely welcome uh, to to uh, to us. 
Korean students. I'm not sure what the numbers are at the moment, uh, having, having left the job about a year ago, but it's around probably 25,000 full-time Korean students in Australia. So the links are really very strong, and, but, but not particularly well known. You will have seen in the, the recent uh, exercise cycle, uh, we had, uh, I think, around 25 Australian uh, military forces in the, in the most recent exercise. Sometimes that slips up to around 100 or so. Uh, we exercise very, very frequently with Korea. Uh, um, we integrate, I think, very well. We have, uh, we're working to build a defence cooperation agreement which will facilitate our entry in and out of Korea. We'd like to see more Korean military training with us in Australia, but often the answer when we, when we press this is events are a bit too pressing on the peninsula. Um, I won't go on tonight. Uh, I don't think you want to, to, to hear too much more from me, but there may be an opportunity in, in when, we, when we discuss further to ask questions to address issues around North Korea, I'd be happy to do that. But thank you very much for the invitation. I wish uh, the Australia Korea Young Professionals Association the very best. I, I, I should also say that I think since uh, uh, Liz Johnson has, has taken over management of the Australia Korea Business Council and, and the energy she's put into the development of this too, uh, we've really noticed a, an uptick in the energy uh, behind these two bodies. But I wish you well for the future. I hope to be part of it. I hope uh, at some point you might invite me back. I intend to keep up my links with Korea. I feel I have a strong commitment to the relationship and although I no longer am an Australian ambassador, I intend to uh, continue to play a role. Thank you very much. Final speaker for the evening will be Mr. Shane Elliott, who is currently the CEO of ANZ Banking Group. Mr. Elliott joined ANZ as CEO Institutional in 2009, and in 2012, he was appointed the group CFO. Mr. Elliott has over 30 years of experience in international banking, including in Australia, New Zealand, USA, UK, Asia Pacific, and Middle East. He was previously with Citigroup for over 20 years, where he has held various senior positions across geographies and business sectors, including CEO, Global Transactional Services Asia Pacific, Country Head of Australia and New Zealand, and Country Head of, out of all places, Egypt. So, could you please welcome Mr. Elliot to the stage? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I like it when I get introduced that I'm currently the CEO of uh, ANZ. I, I think it's a good reminder that, you know, you can never be too sure where you're going to be next week. But anyway, I am, I am currently the CEO, and I'm actually really proud to be the CEO of ANZ. I'm not going to talk a little, too much about our career. I think Bill did a great job, and Liz talking about, and you, all know, you, you know that, and that was, that was great. I'm going to talk a little bit about ANZ and why we're there. And um, I'll just talk about myself. First time I went to South Korea, actually, I was trying to remember on the way down, I think it was 2001, and uh, I was actually the country head for Citibank in Australia, in New Zealand, and I was living in Sydney, and uh, i just got married to my wife, who's Egyptian, and we'd moved to Sydney, and uh, in those days at the bank, the bank had this program that uh, when you were auditing, we would do these internal audits, you would be this guest auditor, and they would send you off, and it was a great experience to go, and we, I got this role to go and help audit the Citibank in Korea, never having been there before, so I took my new wife in, we went and we were there for a couple of weeks and it was a great experience actually. And um, although there was this point, my wife was kind of stuck in the hotel, didn't really know anybody, didn't know what to do and so she's reading the you know, brochure of all the things you can do in South Korea and Seoul, keep yourself occupied and they come home one night and she said, oh, they have shooting lessons. And I said, no, no, that, I don't know, that's a very good idea for you to spend your time learning how to shoot. But anyway, we did that. I then um, was fortunate enough many years later uh, to be running a business out of Hong Kong where I looked after a bunch of 15 countries across the Asia Pacific for a series of businesses and one of our most important countries was Korea. In fact we had a, of the 15 countries I looked after we had the strategy called, it wasn't BRIC but it was a JIC strategy with Japan, India, China and Korea and that was when I really got to know Korea as a business destination. I used to spend quite a bit of time in Seoul uh, both with uh, Korean uh, companies who were operating across the region, including here in Australia, 
and also multinationals that were operating uh, in Korea. So I had quite a bit of experience uh, doing that, and I used to go there quite often. I was on a small board of a, a securities company there. And, um, and then the city, we acquired a, a bank there, Koran Bank, which is the Korean American Bank. That was, just, that was interesting uh, times too. So anyway, point of that would say, I have been there a lot, and of course, um, I've, I've enjoyed my time and I've learned a lot from my experiences there. When I came to ANZ, ANZ probably, for many of you, uh, when you think about Australian banks, the one thing we're sort of a little bit different to our peer group on is our connection with Asia. And we're probably known as the bank that's invested the most uh, there. Um, and there's a good reason for that. And I thought I might just talk through why, why, why we do that. And um, I kind of joke, one of the reasons is I tell the story to my own stuff, and I know that some of them are here, that there was a great uh, apocryphal story in the 1930s. There was a famous bank robber in the United States called Willie Sutton. And he was robbing banks, and they finally caught him. And they said, Willie, you know, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. And um, it's a good one because that's sort of why, why are we in Korea and why are we in Asia? Well, that's sort of where the money is. And that's actually where the activity of our customers is. And that's essentially why we're there. But when we just step back and think about what we're trying to do at the bank, and this will give you a bit of context for our operations there. Um, our aim, my aim for the bank, is that we really want to build a bank that customers love. And, and, and a bank that customers love dealing with and it's famous for something. So when people talk about it, they say, hey, ANZ is famous for a few things. And what are those things? And there are five. Five things that we'd like to be famous for. One is uh, powering customers, which basically says we deliver value from innovative and convenient banking services that help people get ahead in life. So we want to be able to do that. That's why we do things like we just launched Fitbit, Fitbit Pay uh, the other week, or Apple Pay and those things. So being innovative and helping people uh, get ahead. Uh, two, we want to be famous for thriving employees, attracting the really the very best and most diverse team of people, adaptive, astute leaders, regardless of where they ultimately work. And what we mean by that is one of the great things we're really proud of at ANZ, and actually people who notice who come here from other places, is when you walk in the door, this is a really diverse place. And we have people from all sorts of uh, parts of the world, including Korea, and we're really proud of that. And that, uh, because it actually makes us a better company. Uh, and so that's a really important value for us and we want to have employees that uh, thrive. The third thing uh, really where career comes in is we want to be famous for connecting uh, others. And that means being Australia's only truly regional bank and delivering seamless regional banking propositions to those who require one. And the reality is that, as Bill said and others, that Australia is a trading nation and uh, it has been right from the beginning. Um, just a little sidetrack here. ANZ was founded in 1835 and we were given a banking licence by King William IV, who was Queen Victoria's father, in 1835. They were faced with a trade boom around the world and they needed some banks. And they handed out a whole bunch of charters to those banks. And only in 1835, a whole lot were given out. Only three of those banks survive today. Standard Chartered, HSBC and ANZ. We had different names then, but that's where we started. Our charter was actually given to a place called Van Diemen's Land. Does everybody know where Van Diemen's Land is? It's now called Tasmania. And uh, we were given the charter to finance the trade of wool, basically, from Van Diemen's Land back to the UK. And uh, the, just a, again, a little side story. The European population of Van Diemen's Land in 1835 was 17,000. And 9,000 of them were convicts. One of them happened to be my great-great-grandfather. Uh, but the point was, that's our starting. And so right from the very beginning, we've been focused on trade. That's who we are. If you, if you look at the DNA of our company, if you kind of look at who we are, what makes us different, we're a trade-oriented bank. And so right from 18, we've been connecting Australia with the rest of the world. Right? We, were the, we, we opened in Papua New Guinea in 1910. You know, we've been in uh, Japan in the early 70s. Korea in 1978. I mean, that doesn't sound perhaps so adventurous today, but to imagine to be first and to have been there in those days, that was pretty adventurous, actually, thinking. And today we're in 34 countries around the world. Most recently we opened in Myanmar uh, early last year. So we've been adventurous, and Korea's been part of that. And Korea's grown from, while we only have a small number of people, there's about 50 people there, 
It's one of our most successful franchises because of the nature and the quality of the companies that operate there, whether they're Korean or they're Australian or whether they're from uh, the rest of the world. So that connectivity is really, really important and actually it's kind of why we're here tonight. So when Eddie asked me to, about sponsoring this, part of connectivity is not just about doing the trade thing. It's also about empowering connectivity of people, culturally and all the other reasons because that's in our interest and it's in the interest of both uh, parties and that's what we're doing. But anyway, I digress a little bit, but that's the third thing we want to be famous for and why we're here to, tonight, to help um, um, bring to the, our two countries together um, for all the benefits that come to us. The fourth one is about earning trust. We want to be really famous for that, for showing leadership on important issues. And that means about doing the right thing and being known for doing the right thing even when it comes at a cost. Because what we say here at ANZ, it's easy to do the right thing when it's free. Uh, it's hard to do it when it costs you something, when there's some you have to give up and that's what we want to be be known for uh, and then the last one is, uh, is a bit more financial but really known and famous for generating decent sustainable returns for our shareholders because if we can't do that then the whole thing kind of falls apart and that's really what we're, uh, what we're doing so we're really uh, proud of our business in Asia Asia we, we get a bit of uh, negative press at the moment because uh, there's a group out there who think that we're exiting Asia and that comes about because like in any business you are constantly changing and rethinking your strategy. Yeah, you learn. You know what works, what doesn't work, where you're winning, where you're not, and you kind of move and adapt and change. And we've been moving and adapting since 1835. And one of those adaptations is to say, you know, we had a retail franchise, a retail bank in a few countries in Asia, not Korea, but in a few others. And we've decided that that's no longer the right thing for us to do with our shareholders' money. And so we sold that business. And uh, unfortunately, people have interpreted that as somehow we've lost interest, we've lost a passion, or we've lost a love of being in Asia, and that's not true. What we're doing is just saying we want our investment in Asia to be focused about where we can really add value for our customers, where we can do something extraordinary, where we can do something better than anybody else, and that's really an institutional banking, banking, trade, and capital flow, helping people connect around export, import, investment. That's what we can do better than anybody else. In fact, we want to be the best bank in the world at doing that, and Korea is an important uh, part of it. So that's who we are. That's what we're about. Um, I'm, re I'm, I'm really like, but I'm, it's great to see so many people here. I wasn't really sure what to expect, actually. I wasn't sure I was going to turn up and there was, you know, four people in a bag of potato chips. Or, um, <laughs> but it's good, and it's good to see a diverse group of people here who are interested in the association. I. I asked when I came in, I said, oh, how many members do you, do you have? And they said, well, none, really. We're just starting. So I think tonight's a great kickoff, and I encourage all those people. You've turned up for a reason. You've obviously got interest. Uh, be involved. And I think you know, the networking of these things is so important, as we find, whether that's just personal, from a personal networking perspective, or from a professional one. And so I encourage you all to take the opportunity uh, to do that, get to meet your kind of people who are interested in a, a similar thing here. And um, I, I'm thankful for the opportunity for ANZ to be able to sponsor this, and I hopefully we'll do that in the future as well around other events, and I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thanks very much. Okay, so I'll throw it over to the crowd. It's it's over to you guys now. If you guys got any questions, um, now's your chance. Um, so, if you've got any questions from the crowd, I'm Australian side on this one. 
a lot of Australian uh, customers and New Zealand customers for that matter are actually reasonably small. You know, yes, okay, these are the big VHPs and all that, but and they can sort themselves out. But most of Australian corporates are of mid size. They only have a bandwidth to be able to achieve so much. The risk I think is that China kind of sucks all the air out of the room, right? The, the opportunity there is just it's in your face, it's in the papers every day, and I have to say if I was sitting around industry putting that aside, if I had to pick, you kind of you understand why people are drawn to, to China. How do you know the careers of the world kind of get in the face of Australian industry and say, hey, we've got opportunity here too? I, I don't want to be too sort of conspiratorial about this, but it, look, look at what the Chinese did to Korea over the last year. When, when, when Korea decided to accept a, a ballistic missile defence capability from the United States, China didn't like this, and China took it out on Korea big time. It, it basically shut down Lotte's huge operations in China, it shut down tourism to Korea, uh, and, you know, there's been this debate in Australia in recent months about uh, this sort of, the, the Chinese have felt this uh, uh, criticism of, of their influence buying in Australia. So we're also vulnerable too. Uh, but but my, my answer, I think, in short would be, that isn't going to happen to you if you do business with Korea. Uh, we have a long history, and uh, uh, Korea, Koreans, uh, uh, are tough negotiators, they strike a hard bargain, but once you've struck it, they're extremely reliable. Yep. Uh, and I, I, I would argue that uh, uh, if you commit to this market long term, and that's important, uh, you, you build trusted relationships. And, and uh, you, Shane, and others of you who work around Asia know the importance of trusted relationships. We Historically, we tend to be more transactional, uh, uh, people, people in the region tend to be more relational. They want, they want a long-term relationship. And I think if you get that with Korea, uh, you're, 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 you've made it. But you've got to commit, and this is where your, your point about uh, Australian corporates are not very big, you've got to invest in this and you've got to do it up front. And that isn't easy if you're a fairly small company and you've got to show returns to shareholders, because it might cost you, you know, some millions of dollars possibly to do that up front. But if you've got the right product and you're hanging in there, uh, uh, I think, I think uh, you, you will build a long-term relationship. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I do think career, I, 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 I don't know how. I, I would guess if you went and surveyed the average person here, but had no idea that Korea was such an important trading partner, none whatsoever, right? No. I, I doubt they could even name, other than you know Samsung and LG, um, I doubt they could really name any big investors here or what, even what that opportunity might be the other way. Like if you somebody said to you, hey, go off to Korea and invest, you'd probably go, in what? What would I do? What would the opportunity be? And what would that be? Well, well I, think, I, I think there's opportunity in the services sector. Uh, and, and in particular in financial services, and you, 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 you know that very well, Macquarie Bank uh, also have done extremely well in Korea, uh, funding, funding infrastructure, getting into uh, less glamorous things like uh, um, waste, man waste management and oil storage and things like that, not, uh, not uh, five-star hotels and so forth. But Korean investment is also making an important difference here in Australia. Uh, property investment, hotels, uh, uh, that we, we shouldn't forget that that's extremely important to the Australian economy too. Uh, we see the big infrastructure companies coming in here, Samsung CMT, of course, built the Roy, uh, Roy Hill Mine for, uh, uh, in, in WA, it's involved in the WestConnex project in Sydney. POSCO uh, CMT is also looking at uh, infrastructure possibilities here in Australia. Uh, this is this is all win-win because Korea brings enormously uh, creative skills to Australia uh, and very competitive prices, but also, of course, it's very good for those Korean companies in a very tight international market. You mentioned the 25,000 odd students yeah. that are here. Um, one of the things that I'm a, I'm a Kiwi, and when I, when I came to Australia this time in 2009, one of the things that struck me when I was at ANZ, and I went to and I was running an institutional bank, and so I went to meet all these customers and investors, and I, I Remember being struck by the number of them who were from Asia, 
And I can't, you know, why, why are you here? You know, why are you here? Why, why have you invested huge amounts of money, hotels, mines, whatever it was? The number of times that I got told, well, I was a student here. Yeah. When I, you know, I, my parents sent me here. I was at the University of, you know, New South Wales or Adelaide or whatever it was. And I feel like I know Australia, I trust the system, I like the place, and that's given me confidence to invest, right? That's a massive advantage for Australia. Does that, how, from your perspective, being in credit, though, where does, where does Australia sit on the list of kind of attractive places to send your kids to well, school? Well, we're well, well, well behind the United States. So, you know, Koreans aren't very status conscious. They look at rankings of uh, tertiary institutions. <laughs> And, and there's enormous, uh, enormous pressure in a very high pressure education system to get to the US, to get uh, at best to an Ivy League uh, college in the, U in the US or one of the top tier. But uh, uh, one of the things I reminded uh, 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 Koreans is that Australian universities are rising in the world rankings. I, I've come down from Canberra this afternoon. ANU in Canberra is now in the world top 20. Uh, uh, so, uh, I think, hopefully, that will encourage more Koreans to come here. Now, now clearly, uh, it's big business for Australia. That's one of the worries we have if China uh, retaliates against Australia, that it'll take it out and we won't see Chinese students here, and that, that would be crippling for Australian universities. So, income from students is enormously important. But equally important is that that cohort of students goes back, yes. uh, goes back with hopefully Australian friends, Australian contacts, a good impression of this country, and is a channel of uh, continuing uh, cooperation and hopefully business uh, between the two countries after, after their education. Yeah, that is equally important to the money, I think. OK, we've got a question. Hi, I'm, I'm Scott from uh, Kisco in, in Korea. I, just following on from that question, I, I was wondering if you could share some of the examples that maybe we've seen of where um, companies in Korea have, have provided exchange opportunities for staff between Australia and, and Korea. I'm not aware. It's a really good question, actually. I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's a really good question. I'm sure there are some. There must be around in the mining and engineering spaces, I'm guessing, but I don't know formally. So, the answer is there aren't many because uh, I think language has been a barrier. Yeah. Uh, uh, more and more Koreans, uh, I mean, I first went to Korea in the 1980s and I frankly I struggled to get around because I didn't speak Korean. Not so anymore. Uh, English, English is so widely uh, available now that really that's not a particular problem. Um, in, in terms of exchanges and internships, uh, the new Colombo plan, which has been an initiative of the Foreign Minister Julie Bishop, I think has done a lot for this. Uh, and uh, the embassy in Seoul has worked with a lot of Korean companies uh, and educational institutions to get internships uh, uh, for young Australians uh, in Korea. Uh, Liz, I think, is more up to date with that than I am. I'm not quite sure of what the current numbers are. But uh, towards the end of my time in Korea, we're seeing more and more Australians uh, studying or undertaking internships there. And big companies in the relationship, like Costco, were very, very helpful uh, in that. Um, Mr. Pettison, you mentioned that you set up many of these sort of financial services sort of um, industry, or uh, there might be more activities in the financial services industry. I'm not sure whether you are aware of it or not, but there has have been sort of a new initiative called Asia Region Funds Passport. Oh, yeah. So Korea and Australia are both parties to the Memorandum of Understanding. But I think the current interaction between Australia and Korea in terms of financial services industry or activities are, I think, still quite low. So I'm just wondering whether maybe Mr. Um, Shane and Mr. Patterson, you have some sort of opinion or views about how to promote that industry or financial services interactions between two countries. So, so I'm not an expert on this one, but I would say that my observation of that, the idea of the past, well, the great thing that Australia has 
is it has this technology because of the way that the regulation has been set up around compulsory super. It has developed this great capability of managing money, right? And 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 it's got this, if you will, this technology of how to do it. And the idea was, gee, well, if we really put it this way, can't we do that on a more regional scale? There are other places in the region that are growing and could learn from that. The difficulty is that Korea is not one of them, in the sense that Korea is actually already very good at, it's also got large pools of um, savings that it's managing, and so I don't know that in terms of Australia career around funds management, that technology transfer is as compelling as it might be between in, in other places. And you know, the reality is in general banking, there's opportunities, and, and to Bill's point about, I think, you know, Macquarie has done a really good job around, an, it's, you know, it's a niche, but it's a big one, around, you know, certain, again, that's a technology transfer. You know, Australia, another thing that Australia does very, very, very well is infrastructure investment, because, you know, the country's still being built, the country's developed skills around project finance, how to PPP and all those kinds of things. So taking that technology and using that in other places, like a Korea or an India or all those things makes perfect sense. So I think there's huge opportunity in, in that space. I think, I think in fact, uh, we are in Australia, the more development period has been in terms of asset management. Yeah. And we, uh, Korea's big pools of pension funds, some of you know, the teachers pension fund, the NPS, uh, th these are massive pools of funds looking for a good return and often the return outside Korea is much better than the return inside Korea and we've seen them coming in for Australia and people like NPS and others have developed relationships with Macquarie Bank, with QIC and Queensland and others and there is a considerable amount of uh, uh, Korean funds being placed uh, in Australia under Australian asset managers and I think that's... I, I'm, I'm frankly I'm a bit out of touch with this uh, having left Korea 12 months ago, but that was growing quite strongly. Well, well, that, also, that is so absolutely, just, just like yeah. money coming in from Korea into it, absolutely. That is absolutely right. Uh, I might have called Mr. Shane. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I think there are some opportunities for Australian superannuation funds to diversify their investment strategies. Uh, as we might all know, Australian funds are quite inward looking and home buyers, and they invest heavily in uh, Australian stock markets, but not a lot in overseas market. And Korean stock exchange uh, or Korean companies um, still they have some uh, reputation or not so good reputation about their corporate governance yes. issues, but they do have a lot of so I think if we can sort of develop more interactions and more activities yeah. and Australian superannuation funds might be more interested in That's it. true. I mean you're getting a lot of it. I agree with that. You know, I would put the, you know, there's two sides to that. And it's the same for foreign investors looking at the investing in Australia. And one of the challenges is this, if I'm a global fund manager and I can choose anywhere in the world to invest, I have a wide range of choices. All of those things are complicated. And I've got to sit there and say, if I go to those places, how much time can I invest in learning about Korea or Australia? It has to be pretty compelling for me, because I've got to compare it to Denmark and Germany and Ireland and the United States and Brazil and China and I don't know. So that's one of the, I mean, we see it in terms of the people who invest in A and Z. You know, it has to be, I'm talking about foreign investors. It has to be a really good reason if I'm an American fundamental why if I really like banks, well, I can shoot that thing all in Bank of America City. Why am I going to go over there? And gee, it sounds hard. I have to learn. I have to understand regulation, sovereign risk, tax regime, blah, blah, blah. So your point about, I, I, again, I'm not an expert. My view, my personal view, is that Korea suffers from a poor reputation around corporate governance. And people just say, you know what? It's too hard. You know, if I'm really interested in the tech sector, I can go to other places that are a little bit more transparent and easy to understand the regulatory environment. So I think Korea, you know, I think it has to do a lot of hard work. We can do it. Countries can get over those things. We've seen that. I mean, you know, Korea is a success in so many other areas. No reason to believe we couldn't do that. Uh, way more in from IFM investors. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if you see any opportunities for infrastructure inbound investment into Korea, or do you think the amount of capital there 
it's just saturated the market. Obviously well, I think that, returns. you know, well, that's a global phenomenon at the moment. There's so much capital around the world. It's, there is a problem, there is an issue, and I think in Korea it's probably an exception. I don't, again, I don't, that's not our business. We're not something that we do particularly, but I think you're probably right. I mean, we see that around lots of Asia today. It's just so much money looking for any kind of return um, that it's really hard to compete on that in that, in that sector. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I, I just don't. And again, I think that, you know, Macquarie's in the world have shown that there are ways to, to, to navigate and take opportunity there, but just kind of direct investing into infrastructure. Great, okay, we can move on. If you've got further questions, we've got networking session uh, for the next 30, 40 minutes. Um, Shane and Bill will be sticking around for that as well. So um, if everyone can just one more, give a round of applause. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, if you can just stay on the oh, stage. Right. We've got some gifts for, um, just as a token of appreciation. Thank you very much. Um, drinks this way, uh, food will be coming out shortly, and um, Pavi is just going to give quick two minutes of uh, update for what's next. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Akiba Victoria Chiwe Committee Rule Deshine, Unil Chamsok Hen, Jushin Modun Bundelge, Kamsai Masan Trikimana. Hi, I'm Pavi, uh, and, behalf, and on behalf of Akipa Victorian Chapter Committee, it is indeed my pleasure to make a few closing remarks and express gratitude to all those who made this evening a success and a reality. I must say the energy and enthusiasm in this room tonight is proof that the Australia-Korea bilateral relationship continues to show great potential with many emerging opportunities for individuals and organizations to take advantage of. As we heard from Shane earlier, on, the Korea, on Korea being a business destination and how Australia essentially is a trading nation. And Bill, your remarks uh, on the importance of the Australia-Korea relationship and how much it is un not understood and the impact it has in Australia um, and, and how less we know of it. Um, your, both your insights this evening have been very valuable and we thank you again for accepting our invitation to be here. We look forward to your continued support as Akipa blossoms to foster the development of future business leaders in the Australia-Korea corridor. Thank you, Trade Victoria, uh, for being the major sponsor in establishing Akipa and ANZ for graciously hosting us at, at such a fantastic venue with this gorgeous uh, view. And of course, the delicious uh, catering that's to come. We also greatly appreciate the support uh, we have received from the members of the media present here tonight. Last and certainly not the least, we do express our sincere thanks to all of you who have come out to be with us this evening. We would love to see you at future Keeper events, so please stay connected by liking us and following us on Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter, and of course becoming members of Akipa. We now move on to the networking part of the evening. Please, stay, please do stay around and uh, uh, make use of the opportunities that we have such distinguished guests between us. And before we formally conclude the evening, we'll have a we'll announce the winners of the Lucky Door Prize. So do stick around for that. It might be your lucky night. Thank you so much. Kamsamida.